Welcome to part two of the National Report with Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Keith Rowley. In part one of this series, Prime Minister Rowley examined the conditions which have impacted our country's economic fortunes. As we continue tonight, the Prime Minister will detail his government's plans and the actions that have put us back on the path to progress. So now, stay tuned for part two of the National Report. Let's come back to the natural gas in the context of this management. This slide shows natural gas production and contractual obligations. On this line here is the amount of gas. That red line, which lies above the 4 billion, 4 BCF, right? That red line going forward all the way, going forward, is the contracts that we have signed through the NGC. <clears throat> because remember, we own the NGC, right? So when the NGC signs a contract to supply gas to any gas user, it's a contract. That contract was being met here. See where the red line is? And of course, the blue line, that was our production. So we were producing gas above what we were contracted to sell, up to this point, going into 2014. But then, when I showed you the graph a little early on, you did see the gas production going down. This blue line here is where that going down of the gas supply took us down from here in 2013, 2014 to there in 2016. Look at where our contractual obligation is. Look at where our production is. It was to deal with this imminent collapse why the last government gave the incentive to encourage the companies to try and stave this off by doing more drilling. But they allowed them to write off the capital investment in immediate one year, two years, and that killed our revenue. But they had to do something to deal with this. Right? Because look at where we ended up by 2016 when the new government came into office. That's where we were in this hole. So the government immediately had to address that. That was our lifeblood that had to be addressed. And in this kind of graph, going down is bad, going up is good. What do you see there at 2017, 2018? Some of, the, some of the action they took over here had the effect of having this curve go up at the cost of which I just told you, which was the loss of the tax revenue. But this government had to do something which was not done. That is, we had to negotiate a gas price, get agreement on a gas price with the gas producers. Otherwise, they had down tools with respect to drilling in the years going forward. You recall I went to a meeting in Houston with Minister Young, met BP and Shell and EOG. It was to encourage the closure of the gas price negotiation between BP and NGC, because they were to stand off in that matter. We eventually got that done, and the minute we got a gas price agreed, which BP, Shell, and EOG could accept, and that the country could accept, 10 billion US dollars in investment were kicked off in Trinidad and Tobago. And this is where we're going here. That's what the future holds for us now. And of course, the gas price, because we have a good gas price, and we now have a fair supply, and we have long-term access to the Venezuelan gas, the future of Trinidad and Tobago as a gas-producing and gas-using country is now more secure than it ever was in the last decade. And of course, we had a contract to supply up here. We only had gas down here. So this hole that we were in, we had serious liabilities now. Because the companies that we were contracted to, to provide this gas, and only had this gas, they now make claims on us, as the contracts allow, for four and a half billion dollars. Claims. Because if they didn't take the gas that we supply, then we can make claims against them, as we have done. But if we can't supply the gas that they wanted for their plants, they now make the claims against us. So for the last year, your government has been engaged with these companies in trying to negotiate away this liability of $4 billion, which we are exposed to by having not supplied this gas. 
We've almost, we, we've done a lot of it. We've got good results. And I can tell you, it is not choking us, but some of it is still around our neck. So, the forecast is that we'll go along this path, and by 2021, we should be here. Because we need to keep operating at the level at which we have been operating over here. We need about 4.2 uh, BCF of gas per day. We move from 3.2 down here to 3.8, and we could get to 4.2 if we continue along those lines. That is what a government does for the business of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Let's go back to how we get on in Trinidad and Tobago, how, how we just get on. This is cash in the bank. Because remember, with all, with all the difficulty I was telling you and all the revenue and expenditure, a country has to have, a country has to have cash in the bank. Yeah? A country doesn't go bankrupt with no cash. To manage a country in the international and your local environment, there are accounts that you have to keep, and it's against those accounts that you can borrow and you borrow and spend and pay debt and so on. Cash in the bank, 2010. If you look at all those red lines, that's our cash in the bank. But if you observe, by 2014, we had a lot of money in the bank here, right? But that was when the collapse started. Luckily, we had that. But look at the direction since then. After all that I've told you, you shouldn't be surprised that we have been spending some of our cash in the bank. And also, because of the low price of oil and gas and our low volumes, we have not been earning as high as when things were good up here. So our cash in the bank here has moved down to this level. But we can't allow that to continue because where, where is that going? That's going down until the dung is bad. Right? But the gray is our Heritage and Stabilization Fund, which is a fund that we had put in place. When oil price is above the budgeted figure, the law requires us to save in this gray fund. Understand? And of course, sometimes some, some tricky governments will overspend, like we discussed earlier, and they borrow money and put it in the fund, as the law requires. So you borrow to save. Wouldn't, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't tell you that. But the fund is a heritage and stabilization fund. Heritage meaning it's there for the future, for the children. Leave it there for the children and grandchildren. But the stabilization aspect of it is that if you find yourself in a situation where you've budgeted to spend a certain amount of money and the oil price collapse below that and you don't earn as you should, as we just discussed, then the stabilization aspect of the fund is available to you to manage your budget. That's exactly what we did here in 2016 and 2017. Those two blue pieces there are the withdrawals that we made from the Heritage and Stabilization Fund in 2016 and 2017. And you remember how the reaction of some people were? The bank of the country, the red in the fund. Look at that in the context of the fund itself. Because the fund, even though we have taken that piece out there and that piece out there, the fund is not any lower than it was when we started because the fund is always earning money. Eh? The fund is earning interest. What we took out was in the context of the interest component. And that is exactly what the fund is for. That if you find yourself in this situation I just described to you earlier on, with your revenues collapsing from 17 billion to 1 billion, when it's time to do the budget, what do we do? Close the hospitals, send home the nurses, send the teachers home? No, you take some money from the fund and you maintain a budget that is reasonable and acceptable and we move towards the next year and we do things to turn around this downward slide of our earning capacity. And that's what we've done. So there's no need to be exercised by persons who, with an agenda of their own, trying to misrepresent to you that the Minister of Finance using these little two blue pieces is somehow the sky falling in the country. That is called management of your circumstance. Management. That's what this government is. We can defend our actions in this way, in a public place like this, and none of them could take issue with that from the point of view of accuracy because we are governing with the use of data. We're not governing on feel so and do like so 
and who's sleeping with who and who's sleeping with who. We are governing your affairs with data. We are making the decisions based on the data that's available to us because it is the data that is your business. That's why you're here. You're minding your business and I'm showing you what the data tells us. So you can leave here knowing that it's either good, very good, bad or very bad, but at least you know that is what truth of the circumstances. So when they, when they come to talk to you, you know what your business is. And that brings me to Petro Trin. In this environment that I've just discussed with you, we own an oil company. We own an oil company. It's one of the few oil companies in the world owned and by the people. And then when that collapse took place in 2014, it affected all countries like us. Countries that are dependent on oil and gas for their blood, their lifeblood. We are one of those countries. But our oil company, look at the record. Look at the bag this fella carrying. And who put him in red? <laughs> Up to the point when we intervened, up to the point when we intervened, the prior business of Petrotrin delivered to this country $13 billion in debt. And the only reason why people were lending Petrotrin money is because the government owns it 100%. And it's against the understanding that if the company can't pay, the government will stand in the shoes of the company. That's called a contingent liability. So when every Monday morning as Prime Minister at the Cabinet on a Thursday morning, I have to sign off on the Cabinet approval to allow the Minister of Finance to approve the bank lending Petrotrin money to pay for the oil at the oil tanker, to bring it into the refinery, to refine it and lose 6 or $7 a barrel. Let me repeat that. You are importing oil from somebody else, a hundred thousand barrels a day and paying for it in a debt arrangement like this which involves the cabinet and the minister of finance and the prime minister and the local bank and so on and when you refine it to sell it you lose seven dollars sometimes five dollars sometimes at best four dollars per barrel per day now even though we own the company it's a company under the Companies Act in the laws of the country that should pay royalties and taxes. Four billion dollars in royalties and taxes not paid just to allow the company to continue staying in business. Only oil company in the country that does not pay, or was not paying royalties and taxes. Masabul, Masako. And of course, as we analyze the situation with the best skills available to the government and the company, we see the forecast. And the forecast is for $2 billion, $2 billion in losses every year going forward. So let's say this goes on for the next 10 years. It's a guarantee, $20 billion. Let's say it goes on for the next five years. It's a guarantee loss of $10 billion. So, this is 2018, here. This is Petrochin, unbothered. Actual losses from 2014 to 2018, $8.8 .8 billion. That is already in the book, that is runs on the board. Already scored. But the years ahead, if we left it the way it had been left, with a projection of a loss of $2 billion a year, that's another $10 billion. So at the end of five years, a loss of almost $20 billion would have been the outcome of the oil company owned by the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I'm sure you'll agree with me that an oil company is not to cost you money. It is to make money for you. And? So what the government has done, difficult as it was, 
is to be changing a situation from a loss-making permanence to one that gives us the chance to turn this loss into a profit. So we restructured the company in 2018. Last time I checked up here, some people were trying to put some horns on my head. <laughs> First thing that happens there is that the new company called the Heritage Petroleum Company, which is a subsidiary of Petrotrin, because Petrotrin remains as the legacy company owning the subsidiaries. So this restructuring creates this sub, uh, oil producing subsidiary, which does something very important. The debt owed by Petrotrim would be serviced by this company. So it relieves the Minister of Finance of the burden of servicing Petrotrim's debt, which leaves more money for the Minister of Finance to do other things in the country. Remember I showed you the blue note? Remember the blue note had only $13 to do all the things in the country? Now, if the Minister of Finance doesn't have to service Petrotrin's debt, the Minister of Finance can now treat with national security better, education, health, the Tobago House of Assembly, local government, and so on and so on. So that's the first benefit of the restructuring. And the second benefit is that if we do this well, which is what Petrotrin was not doing, which is look for oil, find oil, sell oil. If we do that well, it could turn a profit and as against a loss, because an oil company in Trinidad and Tobago, properly managed, properly resourced, should be able to produce enough oil to turn a profit. So instead of losing oil on an importation model, we would find the oil through good management and operation at the heritage company and sell that crude oil and get a check rather and put a check out. That is what the restructuring is about. I must acknowledge that to do that, you're affecting a lot of status quo, and some people are not going to be happy. But the country couldn't have been happy with this. The country, people in Charlottesville, in Carnage, in Port of Spain, in San Fernando, what kind of future was this? So when you're minding your business and people tell you, well, I'm affected by the closure of Petrochrin, we know that and we empathize with that, but we couldn't make an omelet without breaking the egg. And hopefully, we'll have a meal for all after we break the egg. But we didn't kill the goose that laid the golden egg. Something had to be done. And those who are out front leading the charge about Petrochin, 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 Petrochin. If you are sick and somebody takes you to the doctor and you get an injection, and you are going to be healthy, who is going to encourage you to complain about the pain of the injection? That's what they're doing. It required this intervention to give us this prospect. Of course, if we burn down the company, sabotage the pipelines, we may then have difficulty doing this. But if, on the other hand, we do what the model says we can do, which is to look for more oil, produce more oil, in a way where you get value for money, create the jobs of those who are going to be doing that. Because some people only focus on the jobs that were lost, important as that is. But by the same token, there are jobs being created. Because we can't do this without creating jobs. While some people would have been affected and might have had a bad Christmas, I'm sure there were some, a few who did, but some people who got a big fat check and got rehired back here, they get the best of both worlds. That doesn't make the news. 1,000 people coming back into this business. 1,000 here. 1,000 people are going to end up here directly. Plus all the contractors who are going to service this company. Contractors hire people. So whether you're a contractor working for Petrotrin or a contractor working for Heritage, contractor and the employees, it takes the same kind of work and employment to do that. We're looking for oil. Finding oil and selling oil, whether the company is named Petrotrin or Heritage, is the same kind of business, and we're going to be doing it better. So that is what this is about, the restructuring of Petrotrin, which took place in 2018. Now, let's compare ourselves with other countries that had the same kind of economy, like Trinidad and Tobago. And I'll draw your attention to a company here called Bahrain, this one, this bright blue. 
When I was Minister of Planning and Development, one of the assignments I had was to create the 2020 vision for Trinidad and Tobago through the Ministry of Planning and Development. And to do that, we had to look to see what is possible for this country as against what other countries have done. Countries that were in similar situations as Trinidad and Tobago. And the, one of those comparator countries that we had used in the vision 2020, 2020 was Bahrain. It's a country in the Middle East about the same size as Trinidad and Tobago, and the economy was the same kind of economy, dependent on oil and gas. And they've since moved into aluminium smelting, which we tried to do and didn't get there, of course. But Bahrain, look at the shape of these curves. It is percent of the GDP, how much of it be affected here, as against the years. See out here, how well they're doing here? Trinidad and Tobago, our producers, the deficit, the budgeting we were doing, we were just below here, meaning that we were running a deficit budget just about here. The black line is balanced budget. Right? This black line going across there by the years, that's a balanced budget. If you are below the line, it means that your budget is not balanced. It means you are spending more than you're earning. Right? So out here, the yellow country, Kuwait, they were spending, they, they were earning a lot more than they were spending. So is the green one here, Oman. So is the light blue one, Saudi Arabia. Trinidad and Tobago and Bahrain, we were running deficit budgets as far back as here. But come 2014, everybody fall in line right here. And every one of these countries had to go into deficit spending. Even though Saudi Arabia and, uh, and, and, and uh, Kuwait have large sovereign funds, the oil shock, that shock of the price collapsing from $93 down to $48, down to $28. Every one of those countries, by 2015, they were spending a lot more and therefore had big budget deficits. But look at Trinidad and Tobago's budget deficit. Even though we were running a deficit all along, in this collapse, we are here below the best, but look at where they went. And of course, they're working their way out like we are doing here. And the only one that's above us in terms of its performance is Saudi Arabia. In terms of Kuwait, below us, Bahrain, below us, and Oman, below us. So these are the oil and gas economies. And when you look at Trinidad and Tobago as compared to the others, ladies and gentlemen, with all the difficulties in the world, if I may say so myself, we could have done a lot better, but we are not collapsed and hell is not our portion. We have done reasonably well. <laughs> now, in Trinidad and Tobago, those who spend their time talking about the theory and crime and corruption, surprisingly, they also spent a lot of time on the fuel subsidy. It was the requirement of the government of the day to treat with how we fund fuel in this country. Because when things were better, we embarked upon a behavior where we were subsidizing fuel in a way that was not sustainable. Remember that $29 billion I showed you that was sucked into the garbage truck? Well, we did a similar, over a 16 year period, we subsidized fuel in this country in a similar way. A similar amount of billions were used subsidizing fuel in this country. Now that we are in this situation needing to do those projects I just pointed out to you, you have to ask yourself, was that the best way to spend $29 billion as against subsidizing fuel just to burn it up and down the highway and keep the price low? But if you get into trouble, at least that was one area that you could improve your performance to give you a chance to do better. And that is what the Minister of Finance did in 2016 and 2017. We set about to reduce the fuel subsidy. Now the fuel subsidy, as the price of oil goes up, because we have not removed the subsidy completely, when the price of oil goes up, the subsidy quantum also goes up with it. Because you're buying the oil. Now, those other countries I just mentioned to you, Listen to what they did in response to the same challenges that we had, which is collapsed oil and gas price. 2014, 
Remember I told you that Chunga, Petro Chung was the only country, the only oil company that didn't respond to the collapse? Well, Trinidad and Tobago as a country is also the only one that didn't respond in any serious way. This is 2014, this is 2015. That black line is the change of government. Egypt raised gasoline and diesel price by 60% as soon as the collapse started in 2014. Qatar raised diesel by 50%. They raised electricity and water rates in the Emirates. In the Emirates. They came back here again. Kuwait increased diesel and kerosene prices. Diesel went up by 100%. And then it went up 200%, and then they took off at 20% after. But it went up substantially. Oman increased natural gas price by 100%. Iran increased gasoline price by 20%. Gasoline in the UAE, diesel, was linked to the international market price price. All of this was done and there was no adjustment of any kind in Trinidad and Tobago. And bear in mind that countries like Kuwait and, 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 and Saudi Arabia and Qatar were carrying huge sovereign funds, meaning cash in the bank. But when the oil price collapsed, this is what the governments did to be able to not leave the country to run towards bankruptcy. They had to respond. Now, after the elections up here in Trinidad and Tobago, Bahrain increased electricity by 60%, gasoline and diesel, 60%. Qatar by 30%. Algeria, 8 and 23%. Saudi Arabia, serious increases there, and so on. And it is only at this time here, in 2015 and 16, that the government of Trinidad and Tobago began to respond. And our response was to remove the fuel subsidy partially, and over a two or three year period, remove most of the fuel subsidy. We're still paying almost a billion dollars in fuel subsidy. But if you listen to some people, you don't, even, you don't know that. We're still subsidizing some of the fuel. And of course, as the price goes up, when we hope it to go up, and what is worse, if the price goes up, we've got to pay more in the subsidy, but not get more because our volumes are going down. So we have to treat with that and try to improve the volume to benefit from increased volumes because we are going to have to pay increased subsidy. But it is only under a new and responsible government in Trinidad and Tobago that the first response came. But around the world, every other country that had a hydrocarbon economy responded in the way that I just described. Here they are. See them there? UAE introduced VAT. They didn't have VAT before. We reduced that by 2.5%. Reduced that from 15% to 12.5%. They introduced that at 5%. But in Trinidad and Tobago, the conversation of the uninformed and the mischievous will tell you that the government wicked and the government this and the government that. We reduced that. That's one of the reliefs we gave when we came in in that environment of collapse revenues. We reduced that. We also increased the taxable allowance to persons who were getting tax-free salaries. Up until then, if you were earning up to $5,000 a month, you had it tax-free. We make it $6,000 a month. So we lifted the tax-free from $60,000 to $72,000. These countries were doing the opposite. Social benefits were cut by 51%. We didn't cut social benefits in this country. Grants were cut by 85%. We didn't cut grants in this country. In Qatar, increased diesel by 50% and increased water rates and electricity for expats. Those of you who know Qatar, half of the population in Qatar are immigrant Pakistanis and Indians. They raise water rate for them. Expats pay more for water and electricity. Bahrain, the country which is very much like us, increased the price of LPG by 11%, increased gasoline and diesel by 14%, and they, are about, they, they have approved an increase in VAT, but they have not yet implemented it. But they have agreed to increase VAT in Bahrain. 
Saudi Arabia introduced VAT at 5%. Saudi Arabia paying VAT? That was news to the world. And they also cut public sector wages. They cut public sector wages. And public sector bonuses were cancelled for a year. Kuwait increased diesel and kerosene by 100% and increased gasoline by 83%. Nobody was heard in Kuwait calling for a day of resistance and shut down and burn down the country. It's not even allowed. Oman increased LPG by 100%. We have not touched the price of LPG. In fact, we are subsidizing it a bit more now than ever. And Nigeria, for months, three months, Nigerian public servants couldn't get paid. And all fuel increased by 67%, and they cut social benefits. These are the options available to governments around the world like us. But in Trinidad and Tobago, we managed to get out of the hole that I showed you earlier on without doing any of this. And for that, this government knows what it's doing, and we are managing this country to the benefit of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> Even though we had to grapple with debt, because remember I showed you how the, how the millions and the hundreds of millions were borrowed and so on and so on? When we had to manage the country, this is 2012, that's where our debt was, right? Hydrocarbon producing countries, comparators. We are the red line. Same set of countries again. Red is Trinidad and Tobago, blue is Saudi Arabia, purple is Qatar, green is Oman, yellow is Kuwait, and dark blue is Bahrain. This is the debt to GDP ratio, meaning how much debt you're carrying as against how well your economy is doing the goods and services you're providing. The debt difference, that's a measure of how stable your country is and what your future is holding in terms of borrowing and being sustained in your economy. Down at the bottom here, Kuwait was never carrying any big set of debt. The yellow line, as we all know, very wealthy country, a lot of oil, a lot of money, they were all down here. But come 2014, you see the yellow line start to go where? Debt start to go up, they start to borrow to deal with their business. Same thing down here with Saudi Arabia, flatlining all the time. 2014, when the collapse took place, they started to borrow too, and their lines started to go up. The green one, Oman, serious borrowing from flatlining here in 2014. Look at where they are, borrowing to make business with. Purple, Qatar, one of the largest sovereign funds in the world, money in the bank, cash in the bank, the largest exporter of LNG. Qatar, they know they were down here. As a matter of fact, their borrowings were going down. See here, they were here in 2012. The, the borrowings were going down. Come the lash of 2014, up it goes. Trinidad and Tobago, very much mirroring the Qatari situation. We were borrowing along this line here. And these were also our high price time of 2012, 2013, but we were still borrowing. And when the collapse took place, we had to borrow. So our line too. And notice all these lines have the same sort of shape. Bahrain, in the worst position, were borrowing already quite high. The collapse took place here, and they're climbing a mountain here. And look at where they are over here with their borrowing, debt to GDP ratio. But the thing I want you to point out, even though we went up this slope, from the years 16, 17, 18, and going to 19, what is happening to our slope? It's coming down. So when they tell you about borrowing and you're going to be dead, and blah, 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 the management of this country, the statistics show, that we have gone up the slope, yes, but we are managing it here, and we are aiming to take it down, and it's beginning. To, and that, that's what the Minister of Finance and the Ministry of Finance has to do. So we don't end up with a curve like this. And this curve, these three curves, there's something of similarity there, and it is because the economies are the same, heavily dependent on oil and gas without significant diversification. That's why this is mirrored so well. And these two below here, that are a little lower, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, they are holders of large amounts of gas and large amounts of oil. Kuwait, Kuwait is one of, the, one of the largest oil exporters in the world. I think the second largest since Venezuela has gone a little haywire. But the Kuwaitis and the Saudis, everybody knows these are countries with huge reserves, earning huge sums of money. 
and even they are in the debt increase pro um, profile, but they have not been required to go to the level of the other countries. Let me come to employment. Because you see, there are some people around this country who have no regard for numbers and truth. I heard a gentleman from the parliament there they telling the country that this government have got rid that this government has got rid of 50,000 jobs. Because the government is the main driver of this economy. If there was any truth in that statement where government jobs had been reduced by 50,000 persons, the public sector knock on from that would have been that the country might have lost 100,000 jobs. Because it is the government that maintains a lot of the jobs in the private sector. So if the government loses 50,000 jobs in the public sector, what do you think is going to happen in the private sector? But because we face you with the truth, look at, what the, look at our data. In 2010, there were 582,000 jobs in this country of all kinds. That's, that was the labor force employed in 2010. By 2015, it was increased to 623,000. That means that between 2010 and 2015, whatever was done there in terms of job creation, approximately 41,000 jobs were created. But to do that, the government annual expenditure was $50 million more, $50 billion more than this period here. Between 2015 and 2017, the number of people with jobs fell from 623 to 602. That means about 20,000 jobs were lost. That's what the numbers are. But why should we be surprised that we lost some jobs? Government that drives the economy of this country saw government revenue drop from 16 billion to 1 billion. And hundreds of millions and billions to spend for debt, which is money already owed, that you take to pay so you didn't have the money to spend. So we lost. But look at what we lost. Of the 41,000 that was created here, between here and there, we managed to keep 20,000 on. We didn't lose the 41,000 that was created from between here and there. So that is what you should take note of. And that is because the government did not use cutting public servants' jobs as a solution to the problems I was outlining to you. We did not use retrenchment of the public service. But some of the things that the government was funding, which was influencing the private sector, there were some losses there. And therefore, that's what it shows here. But if you spend the kind of billions they spent and only created 40,000 jobs, and we are spending far less and preserving 20,000 of that, you come to the conclusion. But of course, even in that situation, let, let us compare ourselves with other countries in the region. Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, Barbados and Guyana. These are the unemployment levels. This is the scale over here, 0 to 18. Jamaica, which is the black line, unemployment was here in 2010. It rose to 15% in 2015, and it's now under an IMF program, and it's coming down in the right direction. But there's still almost 12% unemployment in Jamaica, and under the IMF. Barbados was here 10% in 2010. By 2015, they were here, going down there. IMF program, unemployment still above 10%. Guyana was here at 11%, it's now about 12%. Trinidad and Tobago, with all the carryings on that we carried on and I discussed with you, we were here at 6% in 2010. It came down to 2014. Why are you surprised? Didn't I show you the billions that were spent? Didn't I show you the 2015 election? The splurge? Well, it reflected itself in a reduction in, empl in employment. Right? Now, we are now... Can't, we can't continue spending like that. So the lines start to go up. So by 2016, we have seen some increased employment. And these are numbers we tell you. We tell you this. It's not a secret. 
But now the interesting thing, between 2017 and 2018, it flattened out a bit. It's not going up. It's flattened out, and we're working towards it going down. So, and as you mentioned, thank you very much. What this government told this country is that Trinidad and Tobago, this government will not go to the IMF. We'll take our own medicine and we'll manage it ourselves. So, if you look at 2011 and 2012, where unemployment was, it was here. That's where it is now. So, we, after all this trouble, we've brought it back to where it was here in the days of milk and honey, when money was knocking dog in Trinidad and Tobago, and that was the unemployment level. We are now working this curve to bring it down below, at 5% level there. Now, Getting the job done. Up, in most situations, except on the debt curve, up is good. Down is bad. On the curve of energy exports, look at the yellow curve. That's where we were in, in the hole in 2016. Do you see your business on the yellow curve? In 2018, 2019, your curve is up there. So the energy exports are increasing, and we expect that that will continue. The next curve, the green one, natural gas production. Remember this? In 2016, look at where we are now. Curve is going up. We are 3.8 BCF per day. Right? The purple curve, the trade balance, which is how much you're spending as against how much you're earning. And we were buying everything from gold-plated eggs because we are an oil economy. But when things hit in 2014, we came down here. We had a bad trade deficit because we were losing revenue because of what we discussed earlier on, but we were still spending, so we, were, we had a bad trade deficit. Now we are up here where we are in the positive, a positive trade balance. We are now earning more than we're spending in terms of our trade. And of course, this blue one, this is the one where down is good. Debt to GDP. This is our debt going up. It's flattened out a bit, and now it's going that way. That's where you want it to go. That is called getting the job done. <laughs> but after what I told you, let me show you how the inner odds of this beast works. How are we able to do what has been done. I told you it was being more efficient, running a more efficient government, cutting out corruption, and cutting out waste. Comparison of projects. Let me compare four projects that you will know, because you know the places, you know the names. And let me show you how we have gone about it as against how they had gone about it. The Kumoto Highway, that is the one that they stopped, went to the Privy Council and la 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 la. That project, the same highway, in the same place, on the same piece of ground, same distance, same everything. The only thing that changed is that before the election, the contract for that was going to be $550 million. We stopped it and retended it using comparative tenders. No kickbacks, no ministers in my government fighting any other minister for any contractor to get what? Just let the process work. Open, transparent, tender. We told all contractors in this country, support the PNM if you wish. But we promise you one thing and one thing only. is a fair chance to bid. The prime minister is not awarding any contract in the prime minister's house or the prime minister's office. But every contractor could tell you that. That's the only thing we promise them. Fair, comparative tender. You win some, you lose some. When they tendered, it was 550 million. In the second tender under this government came in at 400 million. A savings of 150 million dollars on one project. <laughs> the QF flyover. You know the story of that one? 
that was awarded. Two ministers got into a fight, supporting two contractors. They canceled the award and tried to break up the contract into three pieces, one on the north side, one over the highway, one on the south side. Today, they're only asking questions about Rohan land and Rohan land as if the land that they were going to use in 2015 wasn't the same Rohan land as the same land. All we did was to retender the project and make no demands of the contractors. That project was coming in at $412 million in 2015. It is now being built for $221 million. A savings of almost $200 million. And of course, the Point 14 Hospital. When we came in, that was underway by contract for $1.5 billion. We, rene we renegotiated the arrangements. We got the project started, got it going, and that is coming in at $1.1 billion. A savings of $400 million. <laughs> and when you set that tone, you get the benefit going forward. Because we are happy with the Point 14 Hospital as a facility. We are happy with the way it went. So in building the Sangre Grande Hospital, the cabinet took a decision that the people of Sangre Grande and the eastern counties will get a similar hospital to the one in Point 14. All the facilities just take the same drawings and the same engineering and build that same facility up there. But you don't have to do piling like you had to do in Point 14 in Sangre Grande. That hospital in Sangre Grande is coming in at $850 million which is almost $3 billion under the 1.5, the 1.1 that we even got it to. And of course, the piece de resistance, the parliament building. You recall that I took chairmanship of a subcommittee of the cabinet, which includes the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Works and Transport, and the Minister of Planning and Development. I took personal responsibility as Prime Minister to ensure that these buildings that were rotting and being left to rot and, being, and, and were costing us millions but nothing happening, I took personal responsibility for getting the job done. First thing we did was to cancel this arrangement where the Red House was supposed to be repaired and built for $886 million. The project to bring that Red House back into use was $886 million. We took it away from those arrangements got Udicott to break up the work into 17 packages and tendered each one separately. And a number of contractors won different parts. Some may, may win one part, some may win two pieces, some win none. The end result is we are within months of closing that project for $441 million. <laughs> if those yellow bars were allowed to continue, and it was done in that way. None of you in this room would have gone on any newspaper, any TV, or any Facebook to ask the government of the day where that $1.26 billion was going. $1.26 billion. You would have sat here, and they would have fed you a long spoon telling you how wonderfully well they have run the country and their performers and performance beat old talk, but hidden in that diatribe would have been a $1.26 billion of unnecessary expenditure. That is how we are able to do more with less in this country. <laughs> and when you're doing more with less, you would have seen I showed you what sister countries in the economic environment like ours would have done. In Trinidad and Tobago, I copied this from the local newspaper yesterday or the day before. Social welfare grants to increase from today, the 1st of January. Happy New Year, Trinidad and Tobago. Happy New Year to the people who are going to receive this. Because this is an increase for old age pensioners, which kick in on the 1st of January. This is an increase for persons in receipt of public assistance. And this is an increase for persons on the food card. So those persons who are beneficiaries of those categories, they, in this very difficult environment, unlike what happened in other countries with an economy like ours, in this country, small as it might be, we were able to increase the offerings to those who are least able to carry the burden of this country. That is management. 
Now, we've been where we were. We are where we are. What does tomorrow hold for us? This is our tomorrow. These are the upstream projects in the energy sector where the big companies are drilling and looking for gas, having had a gas price agreement and new gas contracts. The Castle Compression Project is on the way, the Matapal Project has been approved, the Dragon Gas Pipeline is a project, and increased exploration all around the country is going on. That is what's happening at the gas production end. And of course, these are projects that most of them will contribute to diversification of the economy. Well, the Phoenix Park Industrial Estate is manufacturing. What we are aiming to do there, we're building a new industrial park. But on that park, it is for manufacturing. We're doing it with a Chinese company, and that company has the responsibility to bring to that manufacturing park up to 10 Chinese companies that will manufacture in Trinidad and Tobago, and then we export made in Trinidad and Tobago to regional and other markets. That is the project that we have there on the way now. Everything is in place and is about to kick off. Now, that manufacturing is job creation. Because if you are going to manufacture, you need bodies, you need hands, you need, so that's job creation here. The, method, the, the methanol to dimet dimethyl ether complex, that is on the way and should be kick, um, getting to, making a contribution soon. Two downstream aluminum projects we're working on. Those are projects which will involve not aluminum smelting, but today's world, you can buy raw aluminum, bring it into a country like ours where we have competitively priced electricity and use the raw aluminum to make high-valued projects. We are currently engaged in finalizing some arrangements for two projects. One is to uh, make cable, which is the, you know, the, the TNTEC wire, you call it, those lines, those are aluminum cable. We are gonna make and sell those. We, break, we buy raw aluminum, use our electricity, and machinery here, make that and sell that. And of course, we have um, another project where we are aiming to make sheet aluminum, flat aluminum sheets, which are used for construction and all kinds of things. So those two projects are on, uh, are on the table, just about to be signed off on. And the other one, if I come down here, the wheel plant in Tamana, where we're making aluminum wheels for motor cars. This is a project that we had embarked upon in the prior time in our attempt to diversify. It has been left unattended for the five-year period of the UNC. We took two years to review it, to revisit it, and we've restarted it, and that project is now underway. So very soon, Trinidad and Tobago will be selling alloy wheels, aluminum wheels, to the market of the region and the world. That's how you diversify your economy. We move away from oil and gas, or we keep oil and gas strong, but we do other things. We are currently doing a project which was abandoned for seven years because the business is still good. We didn't just go and do it because it was there. We reviewed it, we had it revisited, and at the end of all of that, the answer was yes, it is still a viable project. That is underway now. Petrochin, the Heritage and Barrier Company. The Heritage Company I pointed out to you earlier on is a company that will focus more on producing oil and selling crude oil, paying Petrochin debt, and relieving the Minister of Finance of the burden of servicing Petrochin debt. The Library Dry Dock, again, diversification. It's not oil and gas. It is inviting ships for repair. And to repair ships in your country, all kinds of skills and equipment are required. The first equipment you need is a dock into which the largest ships in the world, going through the Panama Canal, can come in, you build the dock, and the ship is now out of the water, and you can do all the servicing the ship needs. Because ships that go to the ocean have to do that frequently. And when they come in, they have to get a motor service, they have to be people have to be fed, they have to look after the crew, they have to do all kinds of skills. So that business generates a lot of jobs. And all of it is paid for in foreign dollars. That's diversification. We come down here to agriculture. Since 
No, I was a little boy. We have over a thousand acres of land in a repo. Government land, government cattle, government workers, government attitude, government losses, government complaints, government waste. Over a thousand acres of land pasture. Well, the cabinet has taken the decision to absorb the workers who were there into other parts of the public service that is on the way. We went out to the private sector because, strictly speaking, it's not good business for the government to be milking and changing cows. That is better done by the private sector. We went out to the private sector asking for proposals for any person who has money and the wherewithal who may want to conduct agricultural business on that scale that they could enter into a public-private partnership with the government to make full use of those agricultural lands, pasture, for cattle. Unfortunately, we've got two or three bids. The cabinet has uh, evalu got them evaluated, recommendations made, and we're just about to finalize those lands being put into production by the private sector. So rather than remain idle or be run by public servants who go to work one hour, leave the hour after, a cow seven years old, make no calf in the seven-year period, and so on and so on, it's going to be done by the private sector, and in the very near future, there should be herds of cattle on those lands contributing to a reduction in our food import bill, creating employment, and increasing the economy away from oil and gas. That is diversification in agriculture. We've done recently, we provided Carony land for the creation of the most modern hatchery for the poultry business that's, that's under construction now on Rivulet Road. And we made 100 acres of, of grassland available to another farmer who wants to expand his herd on the grasslands of Carony. And we'll be doing more of that and you'll hear more in the not too distant future. We'll be doing some specific things in agriculture so that we can do uh, what we want to do in this area, which is to not have our entire reliance on oil and gas. There are other things that we can do. And of course, we are in Maruga building an agro-processing facility, meaning that all those lands in Maruga that are agricultural lands and the people who are in Maruga, if we encourage them to use those lands for farming of one kind or another, we have to have a facility to take their produce and to convert their produce into something marketable and something that can come to the market without, without tremendous losses. So the agro-processing facility is the stimulant to bring the south coast of Maruga and the areas around to, for people there to use the land and to make good earnings and contribute to our diversification. These are some of the projects that we have over here. I mentioned earlier on the, the San Fernando to Point 14 Highway. That work is going on and will go on to completion so we linked point 14 to the rest of the country. We initiated that continuation with the monies we recovered from the bond that was being uh, slipped away. We, did a, uh, we have a billion dollars of construction on the way out there and we have some more and eventually this project is gonna be completed. The Valencia to Toco expansion. The eastern side of this country is outside of the main economic stream of Trinidad and Tobago. And you cannot bring it in without good communication by road or by rail or by bus. So we have to build the road. You know, when I came from Tobago as a little boy a few years, a few years ago, <laughs> the highway from Port of Spain ended in Barataria. That roundabout in Barataria, that is where the highway ended. After that was Eastern Main Road, Churup, 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 till it reached Arima. And over the years, section by section, we built the highway. And as the highway goes further east and further east, Maloney became town. Yeah. And now we'll continue that into Sangri Grandi. And we have all these lands and all the potential for tourism and agriculture going east. And of course, the nearer you go east, the nearer you get to Tobago. And it's our intention to link Trinidad to Tobago through Toko and through Port of Spain. And while I'm on this subject, while I'm on this subject, when we took the decision to go and find a boat for the Tobago Ferry, and we couldn't find one, and the Galleon Passage was available, we told this country it did not meet the category of a fast ferry, but it met the category of a reasonably fast ferry, a reasonably ferry. And when we bought it, 
as against leasing it and paying millions over the years. We bought it because we said in three years' time, it would be three years old. And a three-year-old galleon passage going out of Toko to Tobago is just over an hour. So eventually, our vision is that that vessel will go from Toko to Tobago. You leave Toko, you see Tobago until you get there. And that is in addition to persons leaving Port of Spain for Tobago. That is how Trinidad and Tobago as a nation will develop from where we were to where we are to where we want to go. Because I was alive when my grandmother used to leave Tobago in the morning. And when she reached Trinidad the next morning, I, just, I was in second form going to school. And from Concord, I could see the city of Port of Spain coming in. That was the name of the boat. Bog. City, city coming in. I'm going to school. I go to school, spend the whole day in school. When I come back, evening, city of Port of Spain, now reaching to Scarborough. Right? That's where we came from. But it didn't remain that way. I also ended up in the cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago. When it was mentioned that we could consider a fast ferry to Tobago, we didn't always have a fast ferry. When we had the experts, the experts say we could not use a fast ferry service to Tobago. Why? Because the seas are too rough. I was in the Manning cabinet as a Tobagoan and the only one then I said, well, it couldn't be more rough than the Tasman Sea. Let us try it as a pilot project. And that's how we brought the cat to Tobago on a pilot arrangement to see if it could work. After the experts told us it could not work, the cat worked so wonderfully well that we went and bought two used fast ferries, the Express and the Spirit. The previous government run the Express and the Spirit non-stop for years without proper maintenance. By the time we came into office in 2015, they had pretty much been killed on the job. And as we take the political blows for not having a ferry in place, the biggest scandal in this government I saw at the end of the year is the Tobago Ferry scandal. Well, the only scandal in the Tobago Ferry is that I, as Prime Minister, the only Prime Minister in this country who appeared in person before a select committee of the parliament to tell the parliament that my government is not prepared to tolerate corruption on the port or anywhere in Trinidad and Tobago. And we don't care who is involved. We have the evidence and we'll take action. You will never see in the papers. You will never see in the papers. In taking action on the port, we fired the two more senior people. And we've taken the operations of the Tobago Ferry out of the port and put it in Nidco. That doesn't make the news. What makes the news is that the Met Office say there's rough sea on the north coast. And the port says the vessel will not travel. And that is news. That is news. But we didn't come into this job. We didn't come into this job to please those who cannot be pleased. We came into this job to make sure that the people of Trinidad and Tobago have their best that this country could offer. So these are our projects. Toko Port, the work is going on to get the, very, the necessary approvals for that. The highway extension to Manzanilla, the work is going on with that. The PTS bus terminal in Scarborough, funded and approved. The, CI, the CR overpass at QF uh, Junction, that is going on. And our two new ferries are paid for, partial payment made, work continues and so. Over here on the schools, we have a number of schools which we are now restarting the construction. Because over and above the millions I showed you there, when you were looking at millions, one of the things the last government did in the run-up to the general election was to issue a series of contracts for school construction with no money to pay for it. The contractors worked, and many of them, it, it, it was so loose that Either we could not find the documentation to pay, or the contractors found documentation to claim. And we have been in a dogfight over this. Hundreds of millions of dollars, where taxpayers have liabilities, contractors making claim, contractors going to court and, le and, and levying on company, and so on and so on and so on. So it's either you pay, as they say, 
knowing that you're being ripped off, or you fight, and you're in court, but in the meantime, the project is stopped, we have got you all that cobweb. And the restarting of a number of those schools are about to begin any time now as we go forward. We are in the court, we are out of the court, we are on the project. But at the end of the day, this government is cleaning up what was one of the biggest scandals of this country, which is a, it's a hundred million, a hundred contracts. And forward in droves, we got all 12 seats. Yeah. And if you look at the cabinet that runs Trinidad and Tobago today, a significant portion of that cabinet and that government is young people taking responsibility for the business of Trinidad and Tobago. I thank you for your support and your patience. I thank you for your understanding, but I thank you more for taking personal responsibility for ensuring that you are not misled. Because it was a Caribbean author and thinker who said to us, a fellow called Franz Fano from Martinique, he says, to ignore the past is to surrender the future. I ask you to know your past, where we were, I ask you to know where we are, and I ask you to stand with the people of Trinidad and Tobago in where we're going. I thank you for coming, and I hope you get <laughs>